Hello, good morning. My name is Nuno Oliveira. That's fine. Uh, I work for GeoSolutions. So this presentation is about the status of publishing Inspire services with GeoServer and Ale. Because in the last years, there was a lot of, let's say, this was quite an odd topic. So a lot of work was done in improving Ale, improving GeoServer. So let's see what has been done. So as I say, I am Nuno Oliveira from Geo Solutions. So you may know us. We are some of the main contributors to Geo Server, Geo Tools, and other uh, open source projects. We have an expertise in different types of works. Uh, we usually work with big organizations, also private companies all over the world. OK, so uh, we typically do enterprise support services, bug fixings, certainly for GeoServer. And in the context of that, we have done several funding to improve Ale and GeoServer in the context of Inspire. And so basically taking down issues, implementing new functionalities that will allow to overcome some of the long pain issues users were having in publishing Inspire servers with this stack. So the main two components here are GeoServer. So well, is a well-known, uh, let's say, solution product to publish uh, several services. So with GeoServer, you can have donor services, you can have view services, which means you can use WCS to publish your data, WFS, WMS. Another major component of GeoServer is application schema, which allows you to take your data from a relational database or whatever supported data source you have and to convert it on the fly to GML or GeoJSON, okay? That will match the an inspired team defined schema, okay? So then we have Ale. So Ale enters here to help us out define the alignment. So well, you have a data store, okay? Like a relational database, PostGIS, for example. Then you have the target GML schema, and Ale comes in the middle to allow you to define the mappings between them. In the next slide, I will explain this in more details. So, the f so the first thing you want to do when you use your server is typically, let's say, having a donor service, having a compliant view service and so on. So the first step is basically to have in the capabilities document enough information that will allow Inspire ready, Inspire compliant clients to understand what your service has to offer and be able to query that data. This means that, well, you need, we need to add some extra information to the usual OGC capabilities document. This stands for both WFS, WCS, WMS, and WMTS. So lately, a lot of work was done to make all of these services compatible with the Inspire requirements, OK? This was not the case like one, two years ago. So this has improved a lot. We have also the WPS transformation service that we can use as a raw projection service. So WPS is a bit the service used to do all the things that cannot be done with the other ones. So there is also some work going on with that one. Okay, so I was talking before about GeoServer Inspire APB Scheme extension. So that's, let's say, the main component. When you are dealing with Inspire with GeoServer, this is probably where we wait most of your time, which is basically defining the way GeoServer will take the data from the data store, and then it will convert it on the fly to GML, GeoJSON, or whatever actually format you want. So this works a bit like this. So let's say you have an initial database, so you have a use case. For example, in this case, stations that have a list of observations that have a list of parameters, OK? So this is a relational database model. And at the end, we need to produce a GML that will match the Inspire team-defined schema, OK? So this is where GeoServer app schema comes in. So basically, what GeoServer app schema will do, it will consume some configuration files that will be produced by Hale, and then it will do on the fly this conversion. It will also do another thing. It will also be able to understand WFS get feature queries, so complex ones, and it will on the fly convert them and very efficiently convert them to a SQL query. So this works on both sides, OK? So to publish the data and to allow clients to very efficiently query the data, OK? In a standard way. OK, so this is 
what the configuration file looks like. I put it here. You cannot see very well. That was the purpose because it's a very complex configuration file. So basically what we need to do here is just to find the mapping. So if I have a table, the column of this table will end up in that target schema defined feature type attribute and so on. Then we need also to link all the elements together. For example, in a new case where you have stations that contain observations that contain parameters, well, you need to link all of these elements together. If you are in a relational database, this is done to join operations. And well, the system needs to know that, that those relationships exist and we'll, need, we'll perform them on the fly. So this is a quite complex configuration file. And that's where AL comes in. Because, well, AL provides us a graphical UI that will allow us to do this in a very, very nice way, okay? So basically, we load the source schema, we load the target schema. So our source schema in our initial database will be the tables we are interested in, stations, observations, parameter, okay? So a normal relational database model. And our target schema, well, will be the the GML schema, the defined, for example, by the Inspire team, okay? And then what we do is basically define the alignment between them. Once we are done with that alignment, we can tell L, go ahead and upload this to your server. And so L will use the REST API of your server, so a management API that can be used through, be used through the HTTP protocol, and then it will create everything for us. It will create all the layers we need to publish, we'll do all the configuration that needs to be done. Okay, so basically you don't have to look at that very complex file, configuration file I showed in the previous slide. Okay, so lately there has also been some improvements of L and this extension, we actually did an extension to support this app schema just server thing in L, so this was a plugin. This year this will be go out of L main release, okay? So basically we transform decided to push it away from L, and your solutions will take care of it, okay? So we'll maintain it as a plugin, and then we'll set up a site, so you can download the usual release of L, and then you can download this plugin for your server and include it in, so we'll maintain it, okay? More information of that will be published in your solutions newsletter. Okay, so this was the introduction about <laughs> FAP scheme, and I will talk about a few interesting use cases we had this year. Some of the, they were the main ones that contributed with funding to improving this. So one of them was BRGM, and basically they are dealing with the borehole data set, which is a European data set with millions, millions of records. And one of the things they need to do is, of course, to publish the data according to a specific GML schema, and then they also so they need to have very efficient full text search because well we have we have the first step where we need to publish the data and then there is a certain step when you go into production and you make your service available to clients people will start to query and then other issues will show up do I have performance enough do my system support the scalability in it etc etc and one of the issues they were having is that full text search were very slow what is a full text search is basically I say show me all the boreholes that have this specific piece of text in their description or in their name this is a very complex operation to do in a database so there is other things a lot more efficient to do that like Apache Solar so basically what we have done is to extend application schema to support the Apache Solar. And so this means that it was quite fast to do a WFS care like this one, where you do a property is like, so you search for a piece of text in a bunch of text that exists. And uh, we make also this work with WMS in a very efficient way, okay? So we are drawing like, we are getting like, uh, from, uh, for all friends, almost one million of borehole views and drawing them in a few seconds. So the next use case was from the statistics uh, unit of Portugal. Okay, so this was a very interesting use case because they had they need to be complying with several inspired teams. And so they find what we call, let's say, the small issue. So this, they look very small, but they are really, really bugging you if you want, if you are trying to reach inspired compliance. So they had a, a very interesting, let's say, stack. So they start with QGIS to basically produce the complex features to arrange the data, 
okay, in the relational database. Then once they add the data in the relational database in the post-GIS data store, they use ale to define the alignments, okay, with GeoServer, and then they add GeoServer to basically produce the GML on the fly, okay, so to publish the data, and then to allow clients to query it, okay? And then they use, again, QGIS to actually, to actually see, visualize, and query this data. There were, uh, this was another very interesting use cases. Just before we jump to this one, there was also some funding from Psyche to do some extensive work on GeoServer to support the isolated workspace, to allow you to publish the same complex feature data set in different endpoints and so on. So there was a lot going on. This is another interesting, okay. This is what another interesting use case for NPRA uh, because they were not implementing. So. GeoServer and AppAPI scheme is not only for GML, okay? So this works in the GeoServer ecosystem, which means that this will support most of the functionalities that are available in GeoServer. So, for example, right now there is some discussion going on that, well, instead of obtaining GML, why not obtain GeoJSON? The question is, okay, but I already have done all the Lingman work to actually obtain GML, so what do I do with that? If we're using GeoServer, GeoServer will reuse that work and just convert on the fly to GeoJSON. So when you do the WFS query, if you request an output format to be GML, you get GML. If you request the output format to be GeoJSON, it will return you a complex GeoJSON, okay? And this is an interesting use case, because so NPRA, they had to implement the DATEX schema, okay? The DATEX schema is not a GML-based schema. So they added that in a MongoDB, is a big model, okay, so it was in GeoJSON, and so basically what we did was to extend app application schema to support MongoDB, so to read all that nested complex JSON definition, to publish it through WFS to WMS, to allow you to, uh, to use styling and so on, and also, of course, to query it. Uh, okay, so another thing we have been done lately is that it was a bit painful to follow all the issues people were having with Inspire because some of them were in the Inspire forums. Some of them were in, for example, very technical places like just server Shira tickets. So what we've done, we create a repository in GitHub where everyone can go there and contribute their issues. The issues they are having or whatever Inspire they have. In this case, most of the people have done it with GeoServer, okay? So what basically has happened this year is that with all of this information centralized, with everyone commented there, we, we remove like half of the issues people were having because some of them were duplicated. So, well, we look, someone went there and said, I cannot use your server to do this because I failed to meet this specific requirement with Inspire. So what we did, we, we look at these issues, we transform them in technical issues, and then most of the issues people were having were actually a limitation of the same technical issue. So this allows us to handle them almost in an abstract and an elegant way. So there was a lot of improvements that went going on. Some of them were, of course, always performance. So make sure that, well, if you publish your data in a relational database, and when you publish it, okay, everything works fine, making sure that when it's queried, it will be very, very efficiently retrieving from the database using SQL. So taking advantage, de facto, of the relational database capabilities, we extend WMTS, WCS to support the needed extend capabilities elements. Then we enter also to more specific bugs. For example, the ability to define a default geometry. Let's say you have a big, a big uh, team model, and you need, let's say, your geometry is a nested property linked to a, some nested element. So we need a way to say to just say, look, if you are drawing this in WMS, this is the geometry you are looking for. This was another thing that was done. The ability to define isolated workspace concepts, the ability basically to publish the same complex data set multiple times in different endpoints with a single instance of your server. So a single instance of your server working as multiple services. Then we had uh, some more low level extensions, the ability to define one-to-one -one card detail mapping. So when you have in a schema, these attri okay, this attributes, so a lot of improvements. The next things we'll have is improvement with storage queries, fixing some no bugs, and performance improvements always. And that's all. No questions? 
can you give us a recommendation for the data providers how to start the process of harmonizing Inspire data? <laughs> okay, that's a recommendation for the data providers. I mean, if you use this stack, well, I have explained in the stack, people I've been using usually involves QGIS to some way arrange the data in the relational database. Then it uses, let's say, L to define the alignments because it's a nice graphic tool. And then, well, you have your server to actually publish and then allow people to query the data we are publishing. That's the stack we have been seeing. Uh, most of the issues we have been seeing, they are quite similar. So it's always the same limitations. I have a very big model with a lot of nested, nested entities, makes things very difficult to query. So we are working on improving that. Uh, some of the things happen behind the scenes, like performance improvements. Uh, some other things will directly eat the user. So for example, make the life easier for someone who needs to map uh, let's say, a team like that. And uh, let's say, th those are the generic descriptions. So more details. And if you have a doubt, feel free to go to that Inspire, sorry, to that GitHub repository and just post the issue you had. Because if you have all the information, all the doubts, the discussion going on in a single place, uh, it will help us, let's say, to understand the technical requirements that should go in your server, AL and your tools, and to actually, let's say, work around them, okay? So good morning, everyone. In the next 10 minutes, I would like to present our approach to transform our soil data into Inspire-compliant GML. As you might guess, it's getting, again, a bit technical. When I started to transform the data, I was looking for some examples in the internet in the field of soil, but I found hardly anything. So next to meeting the requirements of Inspire, I hope, that we can help others to do their transformation with less effort. That's why we will upload um, documentation of our transformation at the Inspire cluster soil, uh, the Inspire thematic cluster soil soon. An address of this discussion platform will be shown at the end of the presentation if you don't know it yet. Let's get down to details. We decided to start with the transformation of our national soil map, one to 200,000, and its database. More precisely, we, that's the Federal Institute for Geosciences and Natural Resources of Germany, based in Hanover and Berlin. That's me, I'm a cartographer working in the field of soil for 15 years with basic experience in the ETL software FME. And my colleague, Dr. Einar Eberhardt, expert in soil science, some of you will know him. He joined the thematic working group on soil that developed the Inspire Data specifications on soil. The BGR decided to use the, the FME from SAFE software to transform the data. So I'd like to emphasize that we had great help from Sören Dubke. He's FME specialist and Inspire specialist at Conterra in Münster. Conterra developed the so-called Inspire solution pack, which offers FME templates for each Inspire theme. This is how the soil template looks like an FME. These templates include a bunch of required writers according to the chosen theme and general Inspire transformers to define things like namespace, local identifier, and so on. On the left, we have to add our source data. In FME, it's called reader. Then there's space for the technical and semantic transformation of the data. Here we have the mentioned Inspire GML transformers. And on the right, we have the Inspire feature classes that write the GML file. Let's take a closer look. The BGR and the soil service of the federal lands provide the digital soil map of Germany at scale 1 to 200,000, short book 200. And co it consists of a spatial data set and a database. This database <coughs> contains about 20, around 20 soil physical and soil chemical parameters uh, down to 200 centimeter depth. Some of them refer to the soil profile, like groundwater level or erosion degree, and some refer to the soil horizon, like humus content or soil structure. This is our uh, source data added in FME. This next slide so shows a simplified representation of a soil profile with the soil horizon in correlation with the mapping unit. On the left, the Inspire data structure, and on the right, the Book 200 data structure. And as you can see, uh, the data structure is a quite good match. 
Now I'd like to, the, uh, to jump to the Inspire feature classes first because we have to be aware of our target data structure. In the data structure displayed in the HUML model soil overview vector, we have to identify the necessary FME writers. Soil horizon is a, profi uh, is a um, profile element. Derived soil profile is a soil profile and the soil body is the spatial data set. And these three are already part of the soil template. As soil contains many observable and measurable parameters, the data specification on soil recommends the additional use of the ISO geographic information, observation and measurements. So we also have uh, to use the UML model uh, soil observation and measurements. And we have to add two more writers, OM observation and process. At the moment, these writers are not included in the in the template uh, and have to be added manually in FME, but Conterra will rework the template shortly. Another important note, the connection between the feature type OM observation and the feature types um, soil profile and profile element is currently missing in the application schema soil, the soil XSD but we are in contact with the JRC and they are sure to complement and provide a new and updated XSD soon. Now we develop the transformation with the help of several working material and of course expert knowledge. In Germany we do not use the soil classification WRB nor the FAO horizon notation scheme but a national classification scheme accurately described in the German soil survey guidelines. That's the green book. So this is the base for every soil parameter of the book 200. Further important materials were of course the data specifications on soil and the guidelines for the use of observation and measurements. And we used the mapping tables provided by the JRC to develop and document precisely our way of transformation. And we created some sort of code lists in Excel because soil code lists are for the most part empty or extensible, and the technical realization to extend code lists is not intended in the JRC registry and not yet usable in the German registry that is currently developed by the Spatial Data Infrastructure Germany, a short S a GDIDE. In the next slide, I try to illustrate our workflow, our decision process to transform a soil parameter. First, we have to decide whether the parameter refers to the soil profile or to the soil horizon. Next step is to check if we need a code list to transform the data, or in case of semi-quantitative values, uh, we define a range using the data type range type. If we want to use a code list, we have to check if one is available at JRC code list registry. Otherwise, we have to create or extend a code list using a national net registry, which in our case is not yet usable. So we have to prepare the code list for the moment we are technically able to fill it. Next part, Inspire Setters. And the provided Inspire GML transformers, general information like namespace, local identifier, lifespan, and validity is added. And so luckily we developed this FME process that generates our soil GML. At the moment, we transform, we transform the spatial data set and of the big 205 soil parameters with the just mentioned restrictions. The size of uh, the soil GML is 125 megabytes and took about uh, 25 minutes processing. When zooming in, we can see uh, the process parts um, for soil horizon and soil profile. Uh, this is uh, the data inspector, where we can see our data. On the left, we can see our, our FME riders. So, to conclude, I'd like to summarize our improvement suggestions. First, the mentioned integration of the necessary OM observation riders in the Inspire Soil template of the Inspire Solution Pack. Second, the update of the application schema soil concerning the missing connections between the feature type OM observation and the feature type soil profile and profile element. 
And another gap in the process is the opportunity to extend code list from the technical point of view. Here we hope that GDIDE will complete the development of uh, a national registry soon. <laughs> Next steps for us will be to transform the other soil parameters in the BIC 200 and in the next step, generate view services, atom feeds, etc. Last slide, contact information and the link to the Inspire Thematic Cluster Soil soon, uh, soil where we will upload our documentation, including um, the source data and the whole FME process as soon as possible, so you can learn something, perhaps. <laughs> Thanks for listening. Okay, so good morning, everybody. My name is Simona Zdeculescu. As a short introduction, I'm working since 10 years now in ESRI Romania uh, in pro the professional services department. And part of my uh, job is also technical consulting in different Inspire project implementations in Romania. Today, I just want to share with you some, of, some insights and best practices from our practical experience in the field of Inspire in Romania. Um, and uh, one purpose of my presentation, one topic, will focus on a complete technical solution, our in-house in solution, um, successfully validated in a few NSDI projects in Romania. Um, it might be helpful for you or not. I truly recommend it because it took us a while and we put a lot of efforts in putting together the, the most essential, the best in our vision tools, technologies, and reusable resources, which help us now to streamline and simplify a lot this process of inspired implementation, especially in terms of data sets and network services. Um, a second purpose of my presentation will be just to try to raise awareness on the new challenges for inspired users uh, in terms of um, making use of this data, all this data centralized. And um, I will... Um, as I, as I was saying, I will give a, a perspective from the practical point of view, and I will start with, I choose one of our latest projects implemented together in, with the National Administration Romanian Waters. Um, the project started um, about a year ago with the need to address the INSPIRE obligation, reporting obligation on Annex 1, hydrography theme. Uh, by this national authority, but uh, then it went to a, a further purpose in creating a WebJS architecture, which not only that will support modern Inspire solution, but it will address other operational uh, users and organizational needs, um, will foster collaboration, user engagement, and more practical application uh, that will address operational needs, in, in basically. And of course, it will give Inspire data, and not only Inspire data, but data assets in general, a bigger uh, purpose. So I was saying uh, this uh, project um, came as an obligation of the Romanian um, National Water Administration to report on the Inspire Annex hydrography team in the Inspire contents uh, transposed in the Romanian in, uh, legislation. In Romania, we already have a national Inspire geoportal, which is supported and maintained by the National Agency of Cadastral and Land, Land Registration. Um, most of the um, authorities responsible or different teams choose to prepare in-house these data sets and network services and then reporting it through the Inspire geoportal. In many situation, um, situations, um, many uh, responsible and participative um, um, data providers choose to collaborate with technology providers in the market in order to simplify these processes because the Inspire specifications are still uh, complex, very complex. And um, not only the Inspire specification, but a lot of uh, knowledge areas need to be um, very well uh, known in order to do a, a good, a solid implementation. So maybe they want just, they choose uh, working software over a comprehensive documentation. This raised some opportunities for us in the field of Inspire, especially because we already have an in-house solution. Like I said, it's based on RJS for Inspire. Most of you maybe already need, know it. RGS for Inspire and, of course, a few other components of the RGS platform on the desktop, server, and portal side. This solution comes, first of all, with the complex uh, geodatabase templates implemented according to the Inspire data model, Inspire specification. 
and of course, um, together with a lot of other mechanisms, technical mechanisms that will address each phase in Inspire implementation, from the data harmonization to the phase of configuring uh, view and download services and reporting it through a, uh, a portal. Uh, I truly recommend this solution because it's simply, it's, it made my life uh, much simpler, and especially in the data harmonization phase, which is the most complex and uh, raised a lot of challenges, not only in following and implementing Inspire specification, but also in getting to know all the input data and the data models. Most of the time in our projects, these data models, and also in these projects, um, this input data, it's not prepared for Inspire because they have a different purpose in-house in of this organization. It serves more production purposes uh, than reporting to Inspire. So the first step in data harmonization, uh, most of the time requires to apply and develop extra QAQC tool in order to, in order to ensure preparedness and completeness of this data. And this, um, for example, in this project, we require to generate totally new data like hydrography nodes based on the network or completing missing fields or generating thematic IDs because um, uh, the data providers in Romania don't have the data prepared for Inspire, so they don't have thematic IDs that, the thematic IDs that required by the Inspire for this uh, uh, data. Um, once having this optimized geodatabase or data sets, input data sets, uh, the next step was to build or develop a special ETL, Extract Transform uh, Load Tool, which is a very complex one in general. Um, because this tool, it simply, it doesn't make a simple migration. Actually, the data migration is a misleading term in Inspire. It totally transformed the data, the input data, into a totally new model required by by um, uh, Inspire. This is also based on the RJS interoperability extension, extension which is based on FME modules and, and workbench. Uh, this is uh, the, the ETL tool for the um, um, hydrographic network. It's very complex, including a lot of serial and parallel transformation. Um, like I was saying, not only migrating data, but generating a totally new model because inside of the tool, um, a lot of relationships between data are generated based on different IDs that needs to be calculated. Um, it's complex, it's not easy, but uh, f uh, it's a very valuable asset because first of all it's one step, um, one automatic step in uh, data transformation from the source to the destination. It is very easy to be maintained and updated because it's editable the transformer unit. Uh, also, it in, it, having a graphical interface, it allows the user to understand the logic of the transformation, so it um, can interact with different modules and update this tool. And uh, it offers um, in, an integrated uh, mechanism for monitoring and controlling the data migration, because once this is run, uh, you will see the number of features migrated on each of these connectors, so we can follow the process and identify the gaps. Uh, I was saying that um, it is a reusable tool because uh, it integrates not only the logic of the transformation, but it integrates a lot of embedded transformers, which are uh, specific to Inspire. They solve and calculate different uh, standard field in fields in Inspire, which are required on each team, not only on hydrography. So we basically um, use these embedded transformers in many other projects in developing other teams of Inspire. Um, for example, some of them are calculating the Inspire ID, Inspire voidable fields, the Inspire setter uh, transformer is calculating the ID namespace uh, and the thematic uh, ID local ID required by Inspire. Uh, the fields um, regarding the lifespan uh, version of the data. Um, all these transformers basically encapsulate the Inspire logics, the uh, coded values, and the Inspire rules in order to generate these fields, which are simply, um, which are required for, or for all the, the Inspire th themes. So we just use these um, transformers in other themes. 
Uh, except for uh, these embedded transformers, the tools, tools also implement some uh, modular operations, transformations required by Inspire, which are also replicated on different teams, especially when required to build networks in Inspire. Uh, for example, um, here we build a relationship between two tables in Inspire, and we, for this we have to calculate some ideas. Uh, water courses segments are given here by the link ID and they need to be grouped in um, a water link sequence which is an instance without geometry and um, it has another ID which is made by a specific embedded transformer through a parallel group operations, group by operations, which generates this ID. So all these relationships between tables I made, uh, are made through, through such a um, uh, transformer which, is, uh, which encapsulates a lot of serial and parallel operation and can be used in other um, ETLs. The, this is the uh, amazing ETL tool. The best uh, thing is that the, for the end user, uh, it is a pretty simple geoprocessing tool which can be run uh, from an interface. It only requires the source and destination data set and the tool um, if to by one step it will obtain the complex inspired geodatabase which includes all the IDs and relationship between the, the, the data. I was detailing the data harmonization phase because this was one of the mo of the most complex yeah, in, in the Inspire implementation process, but the, comp the solution also uh, support the other phase, configuring view and allows download services. Uh, once the geodatabase was obtained in the previous steps, uh, uh, making use of the Add Inspire layer capability, which is uh, available in RGIS desktop, based on the, the configuration maps will be automatically defined, and this will further serve the Inspire view and allow services by simply sharing these files on, a RGS, on an RGIS server with the Inspire view capabilities, or VMS, and Inspire feature download uh, capabilities for VFS services. This was also done for the um, uh, Romanian hydrographic network. The services are on their own infrastructure now. Uh, it happens that these days they are, de they are um, deploying the latest version of RGIS server 10.6, so the new endpoint for the REST services is the one which is uh, in the presentation. And the third step in the, in the process was, of course, to disseminate and federate these network services to the National Inspire uh, GeoPortal. Uh, at this point, only the view services is disseminated in the GeoPortal. The download services is not publicly available yet because the authorities are still discussing the issues uh, regarding free access to data, but probably they will uh, solve it soon. Now, what's next? I started this um, project presentation saying that it has a bigger purpose than Inspire, um, aiming to create a web GIS architecture that will not only serve Inspire reporting obligation, but will foster collaboration, user engagement, better decision making in order to solve real operational needs in organization and user needs. Um, so this is what's next for, for this project. As a, data, as a technology provider and private company in Romania, we are trying to prioritize our project in terms of or, or that balance somehow the business benefits with the challenges of these projects. And we realize that it's not worth it to take a project only to serve inspired purposes in terms of data sets and network, ser network uh, services. Um, so we try to, to see the overall return on, uh, on investment in such RGIS implementation and we try to invest in GIS enterprise systems which, will, which serve first time real uh, needs of the users. Uh, this is the case of this project. We, we, um, the right part uh, solves all the Inspire um, challenges, but now we are trying to give a purpose to this Inspire data and not only data from Inspires, but all the data assets from inside of the organization. So um, our colleagues are working now on the foundation of this um, 
uh, GIS enterprise projects. Uh, they are trying to put together a lot of different sources of data from other directives, not only Inspire, and also from um, uh, their in-house in initiatives. And also they are, trying to make, they are trying to implement some synchronization mechanisms that will allow um, uh, regional offices um, collaboration. Um, also, in the second layer, um, the second layer is supported through different roles of RGIS server and uh, it generates an architecture ba based on web services which will further be disseminated and federated in the portal for RGIS, which is kind of a geo-information model that put together analytical layers, apps, and uh, different uh, um, maps, which will um, foster uh, user engagement, will support field mobility to get authoritative data from the field, will support also European Commission um, reporting, the reporting of inspired data to the European Commission, and uh, decision making. Uh, the purpose of this project is first of all to make use of all the data assets, assets and to, um, for the users and um, uh, for the society, trying to, to innovate and uh, uh, create new information products. So um, the user already started to create some um, apps. We have apps for the hydrographic assets, and we have a lot of um, uh, new uh, apps being defined. The portal is in intranet accessible for the, mom for the moment, but probably it will, be, it will go on the internet soon. So to sum up, this was our complete uh, solution implemented in a few projects in Romania. I was personally involved in this project and I could say it helped me uh, a lot to use the same tools, same technology, same reusable resources because this increased, our, increased a lot of our uh, efficiency and uh, reduce our time and costs. Now we are able to implement such an um, inspired project uh, even in 30 man days. Uh, with all the, the stages of Inspire presented, data harmonization and network services. Um, the Inspire it still has a lot, of co a lot of challenge, of course, but it made a huge progress in building the SDI and um, all these data assets. But in the long run, um, data without giving it a purpose, it's not uh, worth it. it. It needs to, it has a purpose, to, to have a purpose for people, for society and for uh, businesses also. So I think the, ship, the um, next focus for Inspire will be to shift a bit to communities, to collaborations, to user engagement in order to support, uh, uh, to make use of this data and support, uh, put the digital transformations in uh, uh, the, the scope of the people. So to be more agile drive, driven, it's also essential in the um, and to be to have a more practical approach is, is essential in the digital environment, very volatile that uh, we are facing right now. This is uh, our practical perspective. So, if you need a demo or if you need to change ideas, you can find me here these days. Thank you. Perfect. Good morning. My name is Thorsten Friebe. I will talk about, thank you, about um, a German uh, standard Xplanung and uh, the underlying technical Xplan GML and how we made it to transform that data into Inspire plant land use. Before I start, I would like to know in the audience um, who actually addressed the plant land use Annex 3. Team. No one? Okay. <laughs> okay, at least a few already tried to approach it. The tool or the solution I'm going to present is called Xplanbox Box, and that's the one I'm going to talk about. Um, as I said, my name is Thorsten Friebe from Latlon, and I'm also um, part of the technical management team of the open source project degree, which is part of that solution. 
So, what is Xplan Box? Um, it's derived from its name from Xplan Nunc, it's a German national standard, and it's a solution built with open source software. And with open source software to provide data in different formats, in which different formats we are serving with that solution I'm going to explain. Before I go into the technical stuff, but it will be XML, UML free presentation. So we don't expect any XML or heavy stuff. So it's low level introducing what our solution is about. I have to say some words about the German standard X planung. It has been in development over years. It started in 2004 and our company Latlon has been in a working group um, following that discussion. And I think the great step was last year that from a national level, X planung has become a standard. And uh, beginning of this year, there's um, a coordinating office now in Hamburg, um, provided by um, the city of Hamburg, who is organizing this national standard. This national standard um, provides a semantic data model for describing the geopart and the logical content of a spatial plan. So it's like the Annex 3 plant land use theme, but with a very specific German point of view on that thematic. It's using also GML um, as a data exchange format and tries to address all the different levels where spatial planning comes to into place. So the goal of X-Planung is to make the exchange between the different stakeholders within the area of X-Planung easier. So from the authorities um, using X-Planung as the national standard to exchange data with different parties. It could be the public, it could be a neighbor municipality, um, it could be a planning agency participating in the process of providing special plans. And of course, in the private sector or um, also the real estate uh, agencies. So our challenges have been over the years since we um, started really from the very beginning of X-Planung to support the different versions of X-Planung. When it started, it was a version two, and now we are in uh, version 5.1. And um, Xplanung is complex GML, and as we know, and used with Inspire, it uses all the facility and possibilities of GML. So besides of having a full vector-based uh, geometry and uh, describing data in the Xplan GML, it's possible in the national standard to attach data to the XPlan GML, which could be a raster data with a scanned plan from the old, old history, and additional documents like a PDF scan with a legal part of it. And everything has to provide it um, in a single place. And um, that's um, the main, main challenge. And since the um, Inspire Directive now says with the Annex 3 theme plan land use that uh, spatial plan has to be published under the Inspire Directive, the question is, okay, so how can we transform that data in different data models, different versions, into the Inspire data theme? So we were checking, okay, what, what can we use, what we already have, um, what is in the open source community and um, our solution is more about configurating or configuration of different open source tools. Uh, the major building block of that solution is uh, the open source project Degree, Degree Web Service. We are quite familiar with that so we have chosen Degree. But we also used uh, GDAL, which is from the OSGEO project, um, GeoTools Open Layers, and an open source database, Postgres, with the extension PostGIS. 
And lately we have used then Hail as the um, tool, it's open source as well, um, for the transformation part. If you haven't heard about degree, just one slide. Um, it's an OSGU project and it is, I think, the right tool for um, complex GML. It is a reference implementation of the OGC standard, uh, which says that it is compliant. So we do have that badge that it's compliant to GML 3.2.1. And it's also reference implementation for relevant service specification like WMS and WFS. So what we built is a solution where the building blocks of the XPlan box are a new tool um, for data management. We have called it XPlan Validator and XPlan Manager. I will give a short uh, or a screenshot of those tools. But the major part is that we set up a database for the National Standard X Planung. And um, on top of that, we do have um, view and download services complying to the national standard. And we do have a um, database containing the transformed data into the Inspire Plant Land Use Scheme. And for that, we're using a tool for the ETL process, as I said, it's HAIL. So the major thing about here is that we have to raster data and additional data for the explanation stuff. And we do have a transformation of the full vector, um, vector data into the Inspire plant land use scheme. A major challenge here is that we do have different versions of Xplanung and all those different versions has to fit into this database so to make the transformation possible. And there we have come to the conclusion that we need first, before we import data into our system, we need a validator. Even Xplan GML is supported by a lot of tools from um, different um, commercial um, providers, um, we have to find a format which allows us to bring all the stuff necessary. So it was not only the GML, it's also the attached data, a PDF document, a PNG or TIFF file, into a file format which allows it that this file is self or self-contained, so it has no references to documents outside because it has to be imported into the system. And for that we developed a, a validator which checks if all the um, constraints from the national standards are fulfilled and checks even if the um, raster data or other data is at its place as it should be. And even if it's not, uh, the validator says, well, it's not ready for import and if yes, it can be imported. And for that we developed a, a tool. It's um, using or calling the open source software components. And we call that the XPlan Manager. As you see, we still derive the names from the German local standard, so everything starts with XPlan. And to provide the data attached to the plan, like the PDF scans or the raster data, we set up a WMS which serves not only the raster data, it also serves the vector data. And you even can uh, um, access the attached documents with the get feature info, so you have access to the whole plan as it was uploaded over a standard interface like WMS. If you want to access the pure GML part, there's a WFS as well, but most clients are not capable of handling that complex GML. Commercial and open source software are still struggling with that complex schemes. So the goal was to set up a new service with our own data scheme, we called it a Zunz, um, a simplified flat model, which is capable to um, 
bring all the different version of X planning together. So it doesn't matter if you import your plan in two, three, four dot zero, four one five. You have one WFS where you can access this data. It's flat, so most GIS clients are capable in accessing this data, and you can work with that. Before you can do that, just to have an impression how the validation report looks like, it's a, a tool, it's a graphical UI, but we do have a command line tool um, below of that, so you can do everything from the command line. You will get um, a validation report if the data is ready for import. Um, it checks with, our, um, of course, the um, XSD, so schema compliance, but also additional rules which have been transformed in query, X queries, um, which are applied against the instance document. And you can have um, an export of the results in different formats. Oops. The manager is also um, um, a URI component. There's a command line interface as well. Both of the components do have a REST API, which allows, after the import um, has been successful, to see what data look like in the system. So the last step of our solution was then to, to make it possible to have a um, Inspire Plant Land Use um, service. And we decided that we are not using an on-fly transformation. Um, we set up a new database um, which allows the storage of um, plant land use data in GML format. It's uh, degree, degree specific. It's a blob mode which is storing the data as it is. And the tool which is transforming the data from Xplanung to plant land use is uh, we have chosen Hail because it's open source and fits in our um, stack very well. The nice, nice thing about it, you don't have to struggle with a tool. You even don't see it. It's underneath. There's a little button in the UI of the manager, and you can say just publish is the data to plant land use. And then it's doing it, and it sets up WMS and the WFS, both compliant to the um, specifications. The transformation uh, routes, why, are non, why it's not so important to talk about them in details, um, lucky or the good situation is there's um, a documentation available um, developed by um, the um, official um, um, yeah, standard group um, which says how to transform from Xplanung to Inspire PLU. We just made it to a configuration of fail, and that's incorporated into our solution. So what, is, what are the benefits of using our solution, which we call Xplanbox, is that we do have um, download and view services for both standards for the national data model Xplanung and the harmonized data model from plant land use. It can serve all versions of Xplanung and provides a simplified data model which allows the access of the rich model yeah, in a simplified way so you can access it with um, your client. Besides, raster data and attachments are provided and the validator is checking if the data is ready for import. That's more or less the last. Um, our finding why we developed the transformation is, and that may be a question to the audience here, um, that we found, or the question was raised, so how can we deal with raster data in the Inspire context? Um, is it foreseen to serve raster data in the Inspire plant land use view service? And um, still some code lists are missing that uh, mapping is still not uh, fully complete. If you want to have a look on that, um, it has been sponsored by um, um, money from the European Commission. It's um, at, uh, in a small community in, in um, Brandenburg, in the uh, East uh, German part. Uh, you can see that. We do have a demo running 
you can check that. And if you're interesting, uh, interested in host your own um, instance, we do have Docker images available for on-premise or cloud um, services. So um, that requires um, a subscription of the um, enterprise uh, degree enterprise product we are uh, offering. And if you do have questions about our offering or our solution, how we build it, um, please come down to our booth. Um, we are in the OSGEO Europe booth um, in the main entrance hall, and I would like, if you do have questions, to answer them. Thank you. Um, good morning, everybody. Welcome to the session. Um, I will talk about integration of Inspire and STMX data infrastructure for the 2021 census. Um, my name is Hannes Reuter. I'm yeah, giving the presentation on all of my colleagues, which I mentioned there, which have worked with us on that issue. Um, let me start with a question. How many of you know what is Eurostat? Okay. So, how many of you know what is STMix? Oh, surprisingly many, okay. How many of you know you, what is Inspire? <laughs> I, oh, 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 oh. Okay, good. Um, so, for the people who know Eurostat, there's an echo here. Um, if you want to look at the EC stand, you find I brought paper copies. So if you want our Eurostat regional yearbook and our urban cities, so these are publications we are making. This is actually the data Eurostat is making out of these kind of data streams we are will talk in the next 15 minutes about. So that's the reason why. If you want to bring more paper home, please go down to the uh, EC stand. You find it there and you can take it. And I will just circulate these kind of copies here. I forgot something. How many of you know what is a census? Wow. OK, I still will ask you a couple of questions to give you a little introduction why we're talking here about that one. Because we have two different communities. We have our statistical communities, which are working with, for example, STMX for data exchange. And we have our, let's say, geographic communities, where we do data exchange with OGC Inspire standards. And here, we're trying to marry both of them. So a little bit more background. So what is the census? What will be the census 21? We want to know more about the population and housing in your area. And how has that been done in the past? We got information on persons, families, households, housing units on different levels. So we saw it on country level, on region level, even on municipality level. So you wanted to know more about your area. So you wanted to ask political questions like, what proportion of dwellings in your area is over 50 years old? How many of these are unoccupied? How many single parents do we have in our region? Those are kind of questions we can answer with this census. And unfortunately, we only do it not on an annual basis. Some of our member states do it on, can report on this one. But at the European level, OECD level, global level, we don't do it on an annual level yet. So this is the kind of questions. So what's the technical infrastructure our colleagues have implemented using STMX? So you have our national databases. I saw many people know about Inspire. Can you imagine we would do the same with Inspire? So we have our national databases with the STMX endpoint fed by the National Statistical Institutes, and we have a central application which pulls all these data sets together and provides it to the user. And you can say, OK, give me the data from Netherlands. Peter is sitting here. There's Miroslav from the Polish NSI. So give me the data from, sorry, Belgium. So we, we, we want to know what is Poland, um, Netherlands, Belgium. Sorry, let me just see if someone else is from NSI here. Uh, we want to know what's the housing conditions in your three countries, and we want to compare it and make a quantitative uh, policy decision on that one. So you want to know more about your area, so kind of question, what is your usual res residence, what's the sex, what's your demographic 
change all that one. This is what the census is about it. Um, but what's the new thing in the 2021 census is, we will not base it anymore on vector data. We will not base it on municipality, country, region level. We will move to a grid-based approach. So we will report data on one kilometer resolution. So what's the challenge here? We need to implement Inspire at a central level for official statistics. And for that one, we want to reuse existing SDMX data uh, infrastructure. And there's one thing uh, which comes into play. Uh, why are we getting involved? We are responsible for the census regulation, for the population grids. We are sponsoring as well as SDMX, and we implement and develop and use tools to support SDMX data exchanges. So we are running the SDM, uh, the census up. So now the, the question is, um, the member states are usually legally obliged to provide Inspire compliant data services. Right? However, now we would, Eurostat, legally oblige them to send the data also to Eurostat. It's a legal act. So we have Inspire, hmm, where you need to send, you make it, need to make, make an Inspire service, and we have the Statistical Act, where you have to send the data also to Eurostat. Well, that would be duplication. It would be double funding, it would be double work for all of you. So what we checked with our legal team, with DJ Environment and all that one, and with all the national statistical offices agreed to that one, that for this census 10 to 21, what we will do, we will implement at the central level Inspire services for all the member state data. So that's the reason why we say here Inspire compliant census pilot, where we'll show and provide Inspire services for all of the NSIs for this data set. So member states do not need to implement it locally. If they want, they can still do. Hmm? But from a legal perspective, it will be centrally provided. So what it will be in that data set is like a grid. It's uh, 13 key variables per grid square. And uh, uh, we will get the data from that one uh, published as an Inspire service. <coughs> Sorry. Um, which kind of Inspire data themes and statistics are involved. Uh, I think I can uh, quickly uh, skim over that one. We have the grid systems, because we're talking about the grid. We're talking about human health, population distribution, demography, demography and statistical units. So how do Inspire and the census actually align with each other? Sorry. So um, we are working in the statistical world. We're working with the European statistical system, ESS, together, while uh, usually you're working here in the room with the uh, Inspire world together. And uh, just want to m just point out a couple of mappings between uh, Inspire and SDMX. So if we look at uh, metadata, uh, and you see this little SDMX logo or the Inspire logo there, um, and we try to compare Inspire and the census, we see, yes, we do have metadata in our SDMX standard. It's an ISO standard, so just to mention that to everyone. And then, yes, we have uh, metadata as well in Inspire. So we need to have, uh, we have underlying data models in both kind of systems. We have download services in SDMX. Yes, we have download services as well in, in Inspire. Hmm? But uh, what we don't have in SDMX is a few service. So here we have to do something uh, to ensure compliance between both of them uh, if we want to make an alignment. So this is something where there's a difference between statistical world and uh, GI world, if I want to put it up. So uh, if we want to talk about uh, our requirements, um, uh, as mentioned earlier, we need to be legal, legally. We have to check that we meet the legal uh, requirements from our Inspire masters. We need to minimize our double work and investment for our countries. So creating duplicate data exchange um, infrastructure, we don't need that. I mean, it's one time, it's enough, I think, for all of us. And we want to have a one-stop user. So we don't want no new uh, 
standards. We just want an in inspired SD mix. Let's put it that way. So, um, if we want to talk further about our correspondence between Inspire and STMX. Uh, we have a legal act on both sides, uh, where Inspire we have the implementing rules, and uh, in EU, in the, for the European Union we have a legal act on statistics. We have our technical standards on both sides, we have our guidelines, and we have our tools. And then from a portal point of view, or let's say data distribution point of view, we have our Inspire Geo portal at the uh, inspire level as well, we have the census hub at the statistical level. So, me working in the JISCO team in Eurostat, so we are coordinating GIS and the Commission. Um, yes, you can see quite similarity if you take a step back and look a, a little bit more on a generic or abstract view to that one. So, the question for us was from a technical point of view, how do we in implement, how, what, what can we reuse? We don't want to spend uh, millions on <coughs> setting up a complete new system. So um, we already have the SDMix census up. We have similar content of SDMix and Inspire data models, and we have the Inspire geo portals. So we internally running in Eurostat the EC geo portal, uh, and we also have some Inspire view, surface, view services. So why to reinvent the wheel? Let's see what we already have and can uh, reuse in that sense. Um, so. Um, I want to report now on how do we actually map our metadata from uh, SDMix to Inspire. Um, being pragmatic, let's put it that way. Uh, we accept that we have different structures and encodings of the information. It's, as said earlier, sometimes you're talking to statisticians and sometimes you talk to Earth's observation people and sometimes you're talking to geospatial people. And you need to clarify certain aspects and synonyms for them, because everybody understands something different. Hmm? And this is what we just need to accept as a standard. Um, we also uh, accepted that we use STMixer as our base, That's similar to uh, earlier examples we have seen today, today, for example, from our Romanian colleague, which uh, uh, transforms the hydrographic data into the Inspire data model. Here we just choose STMix as our main baseline. And we needed to find equivalence for the census grid data for Inspire, so to create consistent information. So our practical experience is that we, in most of the cases, we could do a one-to-one -one mapping. It was quite simple in that sense. Um, sometimes we found missing concepts, so we added a, a couple of additional ones, and um, we took a rather pragmatic approach. Sometimes data are not provided by SDMix, and then we said, okay, Eurostat will pre-fill them though, from a preset list of codes, and we will set it in. So if data providers provide it, they can provide it. If not, we will have preset uh, um, settings already available at Eurostat. So, um, examples here, gender is Inspire, sex is and is SDMix. So it's simple, one-to-one -one mapping is just a renaming. Uh, or we added additional dimensions. So here comes also the case that we're talking uh, in SDMix world about statistical hypercubes with several dimensions, up to eight sometimes and which we do not have in, let's say, the geographical world. I mean, this is, sorry, we don't have eight dimensions where people can drill into the data. So, uh, as I'm running out of time, and sorry, I'm a little bit slow this morning, um, I want to give a couple of key messages um, for uh, the integrating these standards or out of SDMix and Inspire. Um, integrate additional content as early as possible, transform as late as possible. At least is what is our experience. Maybe it's nothing uh, groundbreaking, uh, but uh, I think this is what were our experience out of that one. Um, uh, our key message, which we want to give away, is that we want to transform centrally, uh, and um, we want to implement it with our best existing tools, so the Census Hub and the GeoPortal for the future. And because we realize that 
with all statisticians and you already know from your users, we need to hide complexity from the users. I mean, this is no way if we write complex queries. I mean, this is not what people want. People want free clicks and then they are done. And this is what we observe from that one. So, coming to my conclusion, um, you can read them here. Um, I just want to point out we're running in production, so uh, we want no disruption to our production, uh, uh, production systems, sorry, and without a double data, a double data sharing burden on the member states. And this was the ideas behind our uh, this work here. And thank you very much for your attention, and I'm open for any questions if I have time. So uh, just a question about the accessibility. Do you anticipate uh, providing statistical data as Inspire services will make it more accessible to non-expert users? Just that STMX maybe is not the easiest thing for non-experts, and I just wonder if you think there's a benefit there. Yes, certainly there will be a benefit because people are, um, I mean, people who have been in the Inspire conference in the last couple of years, they have probably he heard the presentation by T P Peter Brestas, which has tried to, sitting down here, has tried to combine STMX with the table join service to make it visually pleasant with a, a couple of clicks. And I think doing this one now, also creating a view service, have it embeddable in any kind of uh, Inspire or Geo uh, application will help for people drilling down and fi figuring out the data and not being stuck because, I mean, as I said, you want free clicks. If you want to use SDMix, then probably our users, or let's say 80% of you, I'm not talking about the expert users, I'm talking about the guy on the street, he will just turn around and say, uh, I, I don't understand any XML. Hmm? People, I, I see it at, at Eurostat level from our visualizations. We're running the statistical atlas, um, and this is, this is in the, for the book. We make a, um, a web map viewer, let's put it that way, based on leaflet, geojson, and people are clicking on it, and it, we're even featuring on Reddit. You know, there is, yeah, so on map porn. So some, there's huge discussions there where you think, yeah, and this is, I think we need to reach that level. Okay, good, good morning. Uh, my name is, uh, is Paul Janssen and I'm working with GeoNovum uh, in, in, in the Netherlands. My presentation will be on, on UML and linked data and how we can derive linked data ontologies from UML uh, models. Let me also first start with a question. Uh, who of you is familiar with UML? Reading, designing, reviewing UML? Yeah, okay, many, so am I. And uh, same question, but then for linked data ontologies. Yeah, me a little bit. And uh, who of you is familiar with both? Yeah, well, still quite some, some, some hands. Those are the really interesting people that, 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 well, <laughs> that we are interested in in, 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 in in this context. We are looking at those crossover, crossover persons. Let me see how does it work, yeah. Uh, so the content of my presentation will be, uh, we'll talk a little bit about the UML, about the UML legacy that we have nowadays. Uh, a few years ago, uh, linked data came up as a new concept, ontologies as a new concept, and, and, and what they could uh, add uh, to, this, to this UML uh, way of, of, of working. And uh, what we actually did was to combine those two and, and, and in the last place to, to, to derive linked data models from UML authentic uh, data specifications. So our principal goal is to, well, there is this universe of discourse and the UML models describe that universe of discourse. And then again, we want to go to the right side to also use RDF models to, to describe that unit, same universe of discourse, but not that that community does it by themselves. We want to transform from UML to RDF. So that's the principal, the principal goal. Um, the legacy that we have in the Netherlands and the legacy also that, that, that Inspire has is that we are using ISO standards, uh, the object-oriented ISO standards, the, the UMLs to, to make our domain models. 
We use the uh, uh, guidelines and the tips and tricks from, uh, from Inspire, and we combine that in a national, what I call here the Dutch geobase model. It's kind of, uh, it looks like the general conceptual model of Inspire. It combines all the rules uh, delivered uh, from, from up in the, uh, in the pyramid. And then that we implement in all kinds of domain standards. Uh, you see there is th these, these blocks, uh, uh, nicely colored blocks. Those are all Dutch domain standards. So that is what we are working with, UML, object-oriented, and in implementing that in domain standards. Here I put, well, two pyramids next to each other. On the, on the left uh, side, the UML, this geobase model, the Dutch one that we have, which is practically a pyramid of specialization. Uh, basic rules are established on the, in the top of the pyramid, and they are uh, put into practice uh, uh, at, at, at the base of the, of the pyramid. But what happens is that that, that way of working um, provides or encourages uh, silos uh, being uh, 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 constructed silos of those specific domains that all within their domain they have their uh, domain model it works perfectly within the domain but it's not very much harmonized over all those domains um, the domain defines a, a domain vocabulary and that domain stand domain vocabulary usually is 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 uh, 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 put forward as the standard for that domain. That works perfectly, but it's always about domain, domain, domain. Uh, in the linked data side, I, I, I call that, that is also a kind of pyramid, but it's more a pyramid of reuse and referencing uh, 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 ontologies or vocabularies. On, in, on the top you have the generic ontologies, for instance on time, there can be a generic uh, ontology on, on geometry, on location, those big, large concepts. Uh, then there can be a, 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 a general functional layer with uh, things like identification, ontologies, describing identification, ontologies uh, uh, describing uh, temporal uh, uh, models. And then there is this layer of, of, of all the concepts, a centralized vocabulary containing all the concepts that can take place in the universe of discourse. And that's fundament fundamentally different with, with the, 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 left, the pyramid on the left-hand side, which has these silos, as explained. And on the right-hand side, you get this central vocabulary containing all these uh, available uh, concepts. And then again, at the base, a domain ontology is only reusing the concepts that were already defined in this, uh, in this concept, concept layer. So this, this linked data revelation from this UML point of view is basically um, the, 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 the advantage that it has that it can open up those data, data set silos. Silos, on the left-hand side, uh, uh, transported or transformed into one big uh, vocabulary, shared vocabulary. Um, so we started this project, we brought people together from the UML community and the, and the linked data community and, well, and, 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 and worked on this, this, this transformation uh, uh, subject. The first thing that we realized or we agreed on that we were not in competition. That, uh, there should not be a competition between UML modelers and linked data modelers. And one saying, well, what I'm doing is better than that you are doing. There is a, there is a, a, a tendency to have that kind of discussion, but we, but, but, but we agreed upon that, well, that there should not be such a competition. Uh, those both technolo technologies exist, and they are complementary. One is better in, 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 in one side of, 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 of use cases, and the other is more appropriate to other use cases. And specifically, the UML and the XML implementation and object-oriented uh, uh, way of working uh, is, is specifically geared at data exchange, uh, defining data specifications for interoperable uh, data exchange. 
And it's very much about a controlled environment, an environment where you can validate uh, data sets that are uh, exported and imported if they can comply with the, with the uh, data specification standard. And it's, of course, data that should be handled by, by applications. In fact, uh, it's about creating a controlled environment without any surprises. Uh, that's also what Inspire is doing with the data specifications and the XSD implementations that they, they, they provide. Linked data is a much more open system. Uh, it's about the data publication on the, uh, on, on, on the web, handled by the web, and anybody can, can add any kind of uh, data to the specifications, to the data that are already there. And it's more about being surprised. So this controlled environment is much less a concept in this linked data uh, world. And so there are typical UML domain model use cases, uh, concepts that, 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 that you try to uh, describe with UML. I've put uh, a, a few down, uh, down here. So it's, it's, it's about vocabularies, it's about data publishing, data validation is important. And, well, and to a lesser extent also uh, the harmonization between, uh, between vocabularies. The, the linked data uh, community is, is, is more interested in these kind of things. Also, of course, uh, uh, defining vocabularies, but, uh, but not so much about information models, but more about well, the ontologies, of course, uh, which are knowledge models, Mod models that can be used for reasoning uh, 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 and even can lead to artificial intelligence. Uh, autono autonomous thinking systems. These are typical uh, ontology uh, concepts, so they are, they are different. But, but still, of course, we want to make that interoperable. We want to bring those two, two communities uh, together. So again, this, this principal goal, universe, universe of discourse, UML models, describing that and transforming to, uh, to RDF. We extended, uh, we built upon the knowledge, of course, that was already there. Uh, two important documents, the ISO 19150, uh, a standard on rules for developing ontologies and uh, uh, transforming from, from UML to, to OWL uh, concepts, and the Inspire guidelines for RDF encoding. Um, we soon discovered that this automatic transformation works uh, they are those uh, transformation rules from UML to, uh, to RDF, but they not necessarily lead to uh, a, a, an ontology that is very much appropriate. The ontology that, that comes out of that is not optimized for linked data uh, purposes. So that is, that, that's not enough. It's a correct model, but it's not a very proper one, not a very good one. So, we came to the conclusion that you need a manual refinement from this automatic transferred one to, to, uh, to a proper uh, ontology. So that was one of our first uh, 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 conclusions. And uh, why do we need that manual refinement? Well, um, first of all, we want to use standardized vocabularies, standardized uh, ontologies that are already there and they are mostly not taken care of in the UML model that is at the base of this uh, transformation. Um, there is the concept of multiple inheritance that is not uh, available, well, in UML it is, but uh, not in XML, not, not on the left-hand side, but is, 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 is a valid uh, uh, concept at, at the ontology uh, side. So there were some, some reasons why we needed that manual refinement. Um, and then again, we wanted to go from, from, uh, from the, the model layer to the data layer also. So if we uh, succeed in, in, in through manual ref refinement to, to make a proper RDF model, um, we can use that RDF model to um, define automatic uh, conversion rules from XML data sets to RDF data sets. We are not there yet, but that's what, we, that, that, that's what we're looking for. Um, 
in doing so, in doing this, uh, 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 the concept of the meta model was, was key. Uh, we had to compare the UML meta model with the uh, ontology, the linked data uh, meta model. And this is, this is a, uh, a rough uh, description of that. On the left hand side, the UML profile that we have in the Netherlands, which is according to the ISO. Uh, rules for application schema, and on the right hand side, the uh, transformation to the uh, specific uh, ontology uh, vocabularies the shackle one, the Scots one, and the owl one. So, this transformation was, uh, was realized, and uh, well, that was of course only a theoretical uh, example. Um, we tested this on an on, on a, on a, uh, artificial uh, domain model that we created on, 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 on a golf course. And there is a golf course and we uh, designed a UML describing the semantics of this golf course with all the UML concepts that were interesting for this transformation and um, we transformed it to, uh, to an ontology. And in fact we, um, we transformed, transformed it to three ontologies, because the linked data community could not yet agree on one uh, meta model for, for, for ontologies. So that was a setback. Uh, yeah, that, you're laughing. You were also there. That was a setback that, 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 we, that, that we had to face, but, but, but it, was, it was manageable. So there were three uh, ontologies that were created. This is the coins one, which is dealing with BIM. Uh, building information model uh, 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 domain. There is uh, an OROX ontology which was dealing with uh, uh, sewage network uh, domain and there is one we call the linked data general ontology which also includes Chekel in its, in its, uh, in, in its, its, in its meta model. Um, we are still in, 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 in progress, so it's still work in progress. Um, uh, so you see that with, the, with the Vs, the, the, the parts that we have realized already. On the left-hand side, of course, that's the standard procedure that was there from the beginning. Uh, and on the right-hand side, we still have to work on this automated, automated conversion uh, system because we are still defining those uh, manual refinement uh, rules uh, systematically. Uh, to come to a quick uh, conclusion, um, well, the, the principal goal of this project was to bring those both communities together, uh, to find those crossover people that could think in UML concepts and could translate them to uh, ontology uh, concepts. And those people helped us to find to do to define those UML uh, linked data conversion rules. They are still being developed. They are also understood by both communities. They are also agreed upon by, by both communities. And um, well, just say it in, in a general way, that this UML and, and, and this linked data uh, uh, procedures or techniques are more and more becoming uh, interoperable. I thank you for your attention, and uh, if you have any questions. So, one short question. <laughs>